Do you know what the number one question I get from people is? What? What is Chopper? Who is Tony Tony Chopper? Why is Chopper so smart? Well, buckle and this is a Chopper episode. So there was this guy named Gold Roger and he left a bunch of treasure when he died. After that, they meet a talking reindeer who's actually a doctor. But then, a giant bear man sends Luffy to an island of Amazonian women. So, an evil ghost scientist accidentally turns the son of a samurai into a dragon. Then, the Straw Hats become world famous after crashing a wedding. And that's how Luffy becomes King of the Pirates! However, before we get to Chopper, we do need to do a little bit of housekeeping. In particular, we need to talk about our favorite duo. And I mean here, of course, Kobe and Helmeppo. This is once again a cover story, just like the Buggy Separation serial arc. This is called the Diary of Kobe Meppo. So following the events of Shellstown, both Kobe and Axan Morgan's son Helmeppo enlist in the Marines. In the beginning, they are only given chore duties, which Kobe excitedly executes, he's pretty used to this, but Helmeppo just gripes and whines about it because he's kind of a spoiled brat. By a strange twist of fate, Kobe and Helmeppo are ordered to chore duty on the transfer ship for Axehan Morgan, which is to be handed off to the famous Vice Admiral Garp. However, during the handoff, Garp falls asleep and Morgan slashes him, escaping and stealing Helmeppo as he exits. When the Marines try to fire on Morgan and Helmeppo, Kobe, not wanting to see his friend injured, stops them. Helmeppo, deciding he wants to live honestly, jumps off the boat and swims back to Garp's ship, where both he and Kobe apologize for their actions and claim that they are not worthy of being the Marines. However, Garp, impressed with their bravery, decides to personally oversee their training, which is about to become even harder and more arduous than either of them could have possibly imagined. They about to level up. So, at the end of the last episode, like we talked about, Nami had come down with a sudden illness, which Vivi uh, assumes is related to the climate of the Grand Line, essentially saying that the weather changes are just so severe and that she's not used to it, and that's why she is sick. <laughs> funny enough, when she asks if anyone on board knows Lisa in medicine, they, they all point to Nami, which I find funny that Nami is just so integral to their early success. Not only is she their navigator, she's also their makeshift doctor. Like earlier, we saw her be a nutritionist, which Sanji points out, he is now their nutritionist, but he's not a doctor, and so he can't really cure her, he can just kind of make her feel better with food. So Luffy wants to sail to Alabasta to get Nami treated, but Vivi points out that the journey to Alabasta will take at least a week, and that Nami has a fever of 104 degrees, which is about 40 degrees Celsius for anybody not living in the US. And so she may just die on the way, because this is a pretty severe fever. While the crew, sans Zoro, because he's out, he's out front, is freaking out about the possibility, Nami wakes up and weakly tells Vivi to check her desk drawer, where Vivi finds a newspaper reporting that half of Alabaster's royal guards, 300,000, have defected to the rebel side. Because of this, Nami wants to get to Alabaster as quickly as possible and tries to convince the crew that she's not sick, although even in her weakened state she notices something off about the weather that no one else can notice. Vivi then stands at the head of the ship and asks everyone to head to Alabasta as quickly as possible, but she surprises Nami when she says that that means finding an island with a doctor, because without Nami, their trip will take even longer. And so, again, Vivi is just a very smart character, and she's really, she's kind of the real captain in a lot of this. Luffy is the core of the group, but Vivi is very much giving real commands. So the next day, the Straw Hats hit a wintry spot on the Grand Line, and discover what looks like a man standing on top of the water. However, as the Straw Hats approach him, the submersible ship he was standing on becomes visible, and a group of pirates known as the Ten Tyrants emerge and board the Going Merry. Their captain, Wapple, is a rotund, angry-looking man with a five o'clock shadow that looks like it's made out of metal that's like been riveted on. Notably, he eats some meat on his knife and then eats the knife itself before unhinging his jaw and eating a huge piece of the Going Merry's deck to the shock of the Straw Hats. Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji predictably start attacking the pirates, whom they easily defeat, when one of Wapple's subordinates mentions that Wapple's eaten the Munch Munch fruit. So again, another devil fruit. This one seems to let him kind of eat whatever he wants. In the midst of eating more of the Going Merry, Wapple tries to eat Luffy, even snacking on his head, but Luffy thinks quickly and launches him into the distance while Vivi enters the deck and seems to remember this mysterious new pirate. After Opal flies off into the sunset, his crew disperses to go find him. Sanji, at this point, also mentions that the 
weather has been unusually stable, and Vivi notes that there must be an island nearby. And this somewhat explains why the islands in the Grand Line are habitable, even though the, the Grand Line's weather is unpredictable. The larger a landmass, the more reliable the weather is. So the distances between them is not so predictable, and that's where you get these weird temperature and weather changes, but the islands themselves are pretty stable climates. And that's when we learn about the different types of islands, right? Yeah, so Vivi points out that there are seasonal islands, so each island can be divided uh, typically into a seasonal island, so summer, winter, fall, or spring, but then also each of those islands themselves goes through their own seasonal cycle. So there is a minimum of 16 seasons in the Grand Line, and so they are currently, because it's snowing, they must be in a winter island where it's predominantly winter. And then, as she predicted, the Straw Hats soon spot a wintry island covered in snow, which they attempt to dock in and embark onto this island, but the local residents spot their pirate flag and tell them to leave as they don't want pirates on their island. The residents then shoot at the crew, injuring Vivi, but before Luffy and the others can retaliate, Vivi convinces them to not attack as that would only further endanger Nami, with Vivi even calling Luffy a failure of a captain. and. Luffy, he agrees with her, and he joins Vivi in begging for them to take her to a doctor. And again, like we saw as early as with Luffy and Kobe of all people, Luffy cares very little about his, his personal pride or reputation when it comes to the well-being of the people he cares about. So he knows that Vivi is right, that if he angers these people, they're more likely to not help him, and that would just make things worse for Nami, and so instead of getting angry, he decides to, to play it cool and just calm down, which is very not like Luffy. The residents, surprised at their prostration, agree to take the crew, save for Zoro and Kuru, who will be guarding the ship, to their village. Although the lead villager, he tells them that they only have one doctor and she's a witch. They don't really like her. She's weird. As they reach the village, which is known as Bighorn, the lead villager is introduced as Dalton, and he says two really interesting things. First, that this country has no name, and secondly, that he doesn't think the Straw Hats are dangerous to them, that he trusts them in his gut. Again, the Straw Hats, namely Luffy, changing, changing people's minds just on what it means to be a pirate. So once the Straw Hats arrive at Dalton's house, he seems to recognize Vivi just like she recognized Wapple earlier, but she feigns ignorance and moves the conversation to Nami, whose fever has now risen to 107.6 degrees, which is 42 degrees Celsius. She should be dead. She should be dead. This should have like cooked her brain instantaneously. 107 degree fever is absurd. This understandably freaks the, the crew out. And so Sanji demands Dalton tell him where this witch doctor is. Um, and he points to the almost empty castle at the top of the mountain that their former king lived in. He explains that while her doctoring skills are indeed incredible, she is pretty strange and weird, probably due to her advanced age of 140 years. We will find out not entirely true, she's 139. She's not quite 140. When Vivi asks how a woman that old can even get down a mountain to treat people, Dalton says that there are rumors that she rides a strange beast down the mountain. There's a really cool image in the manga of like her riding a sleigh like Santa Claus. It feels very Christmassy. Luffy then wakes Nami and tells her that he's going to take her to the top of the mountain to be treated, and despite protestations from Vivi and Sanji, she weakly agrees. Again, she wants to get to Alabasta as soon as possible because she wants to help out Vivi and her friend and she is kind of the weak link here and she knows that she really hates that. Sanji caves and decides to go with Luffy. After they leave, Dalton tells Vivi and Usopp that long ago they did have more than one doctor but something happened and they all left. On top of that, a few months back a pirate named Blackbeard and his crew of four other people came through and decimated their island then known as Drum Country. So five pirates just like wiped through this entire crew. Interestingly, the Straw Hats also have five pirates. I wonder who this Blackbeard fellow is. Um, however, the villagers see it as a kind of blessing, as Blackbeard and his crew inadvertently defeated their evil oppressive king named Wapple. This news very obviously shocks Usopp and Vivi, but Vivi accidentally lets it slip that she met Wapple as a young girl when her father took her to a meeting of kings as a child. Luckily, before Dalton can prod her anymore, she shifts the topic back towards Wapple. Dalton reveals that Wapple didn't even attempt to fight Blackbeard, and he fled with his army when he saw that he saw their strength. This angers Vivi, who says that it's despicable for a king to abandon his country, but Dalton considers it bittersweet, as at least Wapple is no longer oppressing the people of Drum Island. 
Dalton then explains that the reason that they're so vigilant about pirates entering their country is that they're afraid Wapple will return before they can build a new peaceful nation. Like, he is afraid that once Wapple comes back and tries to take back the throne, things will go back to normal, and that is what he's afraid of more than anything. Like, he just wants good change. He doesn't want to go back to what it was. Unfortunately for Nami, right as Dalton finishes this story, a villager arrives to tell them that the doctor, Dr. Kuraha, just arrived at the next town over. We then cut to the neighboring town of Cocoa Weed, where Dr. Kuraha bursts into a tavern with her trusty reindeer, Tony Tony Chopper, to treat a child who won't stop crying. So we see Dr. Kuraha. She is a decently tall woman with these like purple and pink bell bottoms and a cherry blossom crop top with a cropped jacket, rounded John Lennon style sunglasses and a belly button piercing along with some mild wrinkles. Again, she's 139 years old. This is to be expected, but she looks way better than you would think any six year old would look, let alone 139 year old. Her steed, Tony Tony Chopper, looks like an average reindeer, except he's wearing a pink hat with a white doctor's X on it. And one of his antlers seems to be held together at the base with like a metal bandage. Sakuraha treats this child, albeit pretty roughly. She does not have very good bedside manner. And once she's finished, she demands half the bar's assets. The townspeople, they feel pretty swindled at first, but when the child says that he feels better, the tavern keeper agrees to her demands. Satisfied, Kuraha rides off with Chopper back to her castle now. We cut back to Bighorn. Dalton rushes with Vivian Chopper over to Kokoe to try and catch Kuraha, while Luffy and Sanji fight off a bunch of giant violent rabbits on the way to Kuraha's castle up, up this mountain. Back at the dock, where Zoro and Karu are at, Wapple arrives, where he quickly dispatches the guards and heads towards Bighorn. We also get the names of Wobble's evil chief of staff and evil magistrate. I thought this was so funny that they're called evil chief of staff and evil magistrate. They are Chess and Kuromarimo. This also feels a lot like Arlong Park, where everyone's really getting separated due to miscommunications, where it just feels like the story is being padded out kind of for no reason almost. Like, why are we jumping everywhere? The Scooby-Doo, right? Is like, let's split up, gang. Yeah, like, th there's a village that we mentioned like four times that we just like never get to because it's never important. Like, they just, they just never get to it because it's like not relevant whatsoever. Anyway, when Vivi, Usopp, and Dalton arrive in Coco Weed, they find that Kuraha has left. And at that moment, a guard busts into the tavern and announces to Dalton that Wapple has arrived. Dalton then rushes back to Bighorn, leaving Vivian Usopp behind. And along the way, he begins to transform into an ox, which is a little weird. That's not normal. People just can't transform into animals. Dalton arrives in Bighorn, where Wapple is at, and he immediately attacks Wapple, who predictably whines like a coward. Dalton then mentions that Drum Island, despite not having doctors now, was once widely known for its doctors and medical expertise, at which point Wapple's team of doctors quickly stitch him up. Wapple then makes a comment that Dalton is his subject and his vassal, and he was the former captain of the Royal Guards. But the townspeople, they back Dalton up, and they say that Dalton was the only one who stood up against Wapple and risked his life. So. They don't care what his backstory is, they just care about what he's doing in this moment right now, which is standing up to the king who was objectively evil to them. Like He even has, again, an evil chief of staff and an evil magistrate. Yeah, he's cartoonishly evil. He is, he is like, at this point, the most cartoonishly evil villain I think we've seen. Maybe like a buggy. Well, Bucky's at least, like, interesting. This guy's just, like, greedy, and there's, like, no texture. Like, at least with Arlong, there's, like, this thing about, like, humans hating fishmen that, like, gets him upset. Like, Waffle's just an evil king who, like, hates his subjects and, like, brutalizes them for kind of for fun. There's something in there about, like, um, uh, American medical system. But, there, yeah. I was thinking the exact same thing, <laughs> yeah. because we'll learn that Wapple essentially, he exiled all of the doctors, save for these 20 that are on his team, and when he lived in the castle, he would make people come up to him and beg them for treatment at a steep cost. And all, all I could think about was the American medical system. That's all I yep. thought about the entire time. I feel like this is, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. This is absolutely a critique of Oda knew what he that was system. Doing. Yeah, um, it's not very subtle once you're past the age of like 12. Dalton says that this is bad governance, that this idea of like being forcing your people to be reliant on you for medical care is bad governance and should be a crime. 
And again, like we just mentioned, Oda is criticizing coercive governments. Before it was directly like the world government and the marines as like the police are bad, the army is, you know, is occupying forces. Now it's just kind of like people with decentralized power are pretty evil when, when they're not using it properly. So this outburst angers Wapple and he demands that his guards shoot down Dalton. But Dalton once again transforms into an ox, but this time he's like a hybrid between a human and an ox. So he's like mostly ox, but he's bipedal. And he takes out his former subordinates with, well, one of the townspeople remarks that this is the power of wild beasts that dwell in Zoan type devil fruits. So this is the first time we get an indication that there are different types of devil fruits. So up to this point, we only know, we've only heard of devil fruits as like a concept that give you powers. And now we're introduced to something called a Zoan type which seems to give you the power of animals explicitly. So it's not just anything sort of like how Luffy can be rubber or Buggy can be chopped up to pieces. It's about animals in particular. We're expanding the, the power system in this series quite a bit in, in this. Just for all the furries out there. There are a lot of, a lot of good furry bait in One Piece. Mm -hmm. Although ironically, the best furry bait are not Zoans. They're just <laughs> animals. They're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that, that sounds weird out of context. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Wapple's chief of staff, Chess, then fires a volley of arrows into the crowd of onlookers because he, he claims that this is one of Dalton's weakness, that he cares about people. Again, showing how cartoonishly evil these people are, that caring about people is a weakness. So Dalton rushes in and protects him with his body. And at the same time, an avalanche caused by the rabbits that Sanji and Luffy are fighting triggers near Waffle's former castle and heads straight into Bighorn. So after the avalanche crashes down on Bighorn and, and also injures Sanji along the way, Waffle blames the Straw Hats for the avalanche and decides to go after them. Luffy, now carrying both Nami and Sanji, who's passed out, is intercepted by Wapple, Chess, and Kuramarimo. Luffy, however, heeds Sanji's advice that every blow he gives or receives will be felt by Nami, and he just completely ignores this evil trio and just goes straight towards the castle. However, right as he's about to be hit by Chess's arrows, the rabbits from earlier, whom Luffy had rescued once the avalanche settled, come to his aid and attack Wapple's chiefs. Again, Luffy creating allies from the most random of situations. Soon after that, Luffy arrives at the castle, but seeing no way in but up, climbs for over three hours to the top, even with bloody knuckles. However, as he reaches the top, he passes out from exhaustion. Luckily, before he can fall to his doom, he is caught by a giant gorilla looking animal with the same pink hat as Tony Tony Chopper. So in a forest near Bighorn, Vivi and Usopp, who were left behind when Dalton rushed home, survive the avalanche. They're fine, they're just a little buried. As they walk towards the village, they find Zoro covered in snow, who explains that he went swimming in the frozen river for endurance training, but he got lost and then he was trapped in the avalanche. When they arrive in town in Bighorn, they find that Waffle's guards are forbidding the villagers from digging Dalton out of the snow. However, Zoro attacks the guards, partly because they pissed him off, but mostly because he wanted their warm coat, because he is freezing at this point. We then return to the castle, where Nami is being treated by a little bipedal reindeer whom Kuraha identifies as Chopper. So we've seen three things that could be Chopper. What is going on here? We also get this really great scene between Chopper and Nami where Chopper gets really spooked and he tries to hide behind a wall, but he does it backwards and he's like covering his half of his face and then his body's still out. And so Nami's like, I think you're doing it wrong. And he just flips around and she's like, well, now it's too late. I know that you're here. Kurha then walks in and tells Nami that her fever has dropped to 101 degrees, which is about 38.3 degrees Celsius. So still pretty bad, but not immediately life-threatening like it was before. Kurha then explains that her illness was caused by a bacteria from a poisonous tick that's only found in the tropics. And if left untreated, it would have killed her in two more days. However, she also elaborates that the tick should have gone extinct a century ago, and that the only place she could have gotten it from was a tropical prehistoric island, like Little Garden. But luckily, due to her advanced age of 139, she still had the antibody for this disease for a bug that went extinct a century ago. She also recounts Luffy's arrival, in which he was almost completely frozen solid, while Sanji had six broken ribs and a cracked spine. However, 
Even in his frozen state, he still made sure Kuraha was going to treat Nami and Sanji first, telling her that they were his friends. And I love this scene, it's so good, because it just shows again like how Luffy is so dedicated to the people that he cares about, where he grabs her arm and she immediately knows that he's not asking for help, he's asking for help for them. And I just, I love that Luffy is just like this epitome of loyalty. At this point, Chopper is here in the room with them. However, he's hiding poorly and he's listening in on the conversation. Luffy's talk of pirate seems to remind him of someone. Luffy and Sanji catch Chopper hiding and listening in on their conversation and start chasing him, wanting to cook his ass. They're like, oh, we don't have some reindeer soup tonight. And they start chasing him. Kareha chases them, hellbent on stopping them from hurting poor Chopper. So now we have like this Looney Tunes esque chase sequence going around the castle. Chopper ends up running for his life right into Nami's room where she is still recovering. Nami's up and like moving, but she's still sick. And Chopper tells her that she needs to stay her ass in bed because she still isn't over her illness. And Nami thanks him for taking care of her while she was sick. Chopper hates this. JK, he loves it. He, he's a bit of a sun, sundere, but he's terrible at it, right? So he's like, Oh, don't give me compliments. I hate it. I hate it. The, meanwhile, he's like smiling his ass off. Chopper innocently asks Nami if they are pirates. And Nami tells him, yeah. And he starts asking a bunch of questions about pirates. Nami then asks if he wants to come on their adventure because they need a doctor on the ship. And if Chopper's there, they can leave sooner. He can just treat her on the ship. Chopper starts ranting about how he's a reindeer and reindeers can't live with humans and all this nonsense. And he asks if the way he looks scares Nami. He's a reindeer that walks on two legs and can talk. Plus, he has a blue nose. And Nami replies, you know, nah, not really. You don't really scare me. I've seen crazier stuff. Like, my ship's captain is made of rubber. You're not that weird, bro. As Nami is assuring Chopper that he's not that weird, Luffy and Sanji burst in. They finally found Chopper. And Chopper just books it the fuck out of there. And the boys follow him. But Kareha saunters in. She parks a seat in front of Nami and asks her why she's trying to seduce poor Chopper into leaving her. Nami's like, can't I ask him to go on an adventure with us? And Kareha's like, you know what, he's all yours. But he's gonna be hard to convince because he has a wound in his heart that not even a doctor can heal. At this point, the boys are still running around the castle looking for Chopper when they come across a huge door that's open letting out freezing cold air and snow into the castle. They decide to close it because it's so cold when Chopper appears and yells at them not to touch the door. Sanji is like, bruh, ignore this dude, it's freezing. And they go to close the door when Chopper turns into a giant monster man, basically like destroys the railing on the stairs that he's standing on. He, he yells at them to leave the fucking door alone. Sanji looks at the door more closely and realizes that there's a nest of baby birds sitting on top of the door and if they close it it would destroy the nest and topple the baby birds out possibly killing them and they decide to leave the door alone and run outside it's at this point chopper ends up running into walpole who is climbing outside of the castle but more importantly is at this point that we get chopper's backstory so, it turns out that when Chopper was born, his parents rejected him because of his blue nose. Then one day, he ate a devil fruit, and the other reindeer laughed at him and called him names and treated him like a freak and cast him out on some Rudolph shit because he could turn into, like, this weird furry human and this weird chibi-looking furry human reindeer. Exactly. It turns out that Chopper ate the human-human fruit, another Zoan-type devil fruit. And much like Dalton, it gave him the ability to have three different forms. His base form, which in this case is his reindeer form, a hybrid form, which is his little chibi form, and then a human form, which in this case looks like that gorilla-looking monster. 
these three forms are essentially the basis of what zone fruits can do and are what distinguishes them from the other double fruit types. Also, because he was an animal that ate the human human fruit, he also gained human-like qualities like the ability to speak and human intelligence. All poor Chopper wanted was some friends, but he didn't really look like a reindeer anymore, so he decided to go live with the humans. And the humans cast him out because he looked like a monster. They tried to off poor Chopper, chasing him out of the village with guns. Poor little Chopper didn't know what he did wrong. He didn't know who to blame. Everyone called him a monster. He was basically, there's this line by uh, a rapper, Earl Sweatshirt. He was basically too black for the white kids and too white for the blacks. He had no home. He had nowhere to be. No one liked him. However, there once was a quack doctor who lived on the island named Dr. Hiraluk, and he treated him like a son. And when I say he was a quack doctor, I mean he was a real quack doctor. Like, this nigga should have gotten his fucking license revoked. I think he would need a license first to have it revoked. That's probably his issue. Like, he was dead garbage. In fact, his reputation was so bad that niggas would rather die than be treated by him. One day, Dr. Hiraluk finds a broken and bleeding Chopper in the forest. Dr. Hiraluk tries to save him, but Chopper, who has been treated bad by humans before, tries to fight him back. He saw the gun Hiraluk had, which is just a tranquilizer gun, but Chopper thinks it's a real gun and he had been shot at and he did not trust Hiraluk at first. Yep, and it gets so bad that Hiraluk strips naked to prove to Chopper that he won't shoot him and that he's not a threat and he really wants to help him. And eventually he does and Chopper finds himself woken up in the castle bandaged up. Hiraluk patches Chopper up and starts treating him like he's his son, going on adventures with him and experimenting on creating medicine with him. When eventually one day after a failed attempt at creating medicine blows up, Chopper asks Hiraluk why he calls him Chopper. And Hiraluk explains that he calls him Tony Tony Chopper because he is a Tonakai, which means reindeer, and he has antlers that look like they can chop down trees, thus Tony Tony Chopper. Little baby Chopper is delighted by this, and Hiraluk at this point tells Chopper that the country that they're living in is sick right now. It's not just the people, it's also the government. He says that people think that there's no cure for a sick country, but not him. And at this point, he tells Chopper a story about a robber who, after getting sick with an incurable disease, happens upon a field of cherry blossoms that took his breath away after viewing. It was such a pretty sight that when he went back to the doctors that told him that there was no cure or hope for him, they ended up telling him that he was in perfectly good health, that he was cured. Here I look tell Shopper that basically the meaning of the story is that there's no curable disease. And he does this while pulling out a pirate flag with cherry blossoms on it. And he tells Shopper that's why he hoists the skull and crossbones because he's going to fight every disease like he's a pirate. Chopper asks what the flag is and Hiraluk replies that the flag is a symbol of fate and that the flag rejects impossibilities. Turns out during this time, Wapple has three commanders, Dalton, Kuro, Marimo, and Chess. Dalton seems to be the odd one out because he thinks that Drum Island is basically going downhill with Wapple as king. The other two are more loyal to Wapple for their own like selfish interests. And during a meeting between countries at the Holy Land Marijua, there's talk of a man named Dragon who is spreading dangerous ideas. Dragon we met way back in Logtown. They also call him a revolutionary. Because they call him a revolutionary, he needs to be taken out because he can be a threat to the world government in a few years. Wapple is like... I don't really care, y'all get him. This is none of my business. And at this point, Nefertari Cobra, who is Vivi's father, chastises him for being so short-sighted. This pisses Wapple off because he got chastised in front of basically all the other world leaders. And after the meeting, he ends up 
bumping into child Vivi and he slaps the shit out of her in anger. Vivi just eats that shit and she even apologizes to Wapple for bumping into him. Dalton, who was Wapple's commander at the time, sees this and realizes that Vivi was smart to do this because it basically prevented a war. And at this point, Dalton seems like he would rather work for Vivi and Alabaster than the arrogant Wapple. Now, when we cut back to Chopper, he spent an entire year recovering with Dr. Hurluk. And one day, Hurluk decides to give Chopper a gift. It's the pink top hat with the X mark on it that he wears to this very day. So after a year, Chopper has finally healed up. And what does Dr. Hurluk do? he kicks him out. Chopper begs and pleads to be let back in. He promises that he'll do whatever he wants. He'll give him massages. He'll never complain again. But Dr. Hiraluk does not want to let him back in and even chases him off with gunshots, which when he first met Chopper, he promised that he would never do. I think there was even a panel where Chopper bangs his head against like the door or the wall and starts bleeding and then he's like look here doctor i'm hurt i'm hurt let me back in and here looks like nah you gotta go so with tears streaming down chopper's eyes he runs into the woods thinking that his dad has abandoned him dr hero look takes this time to visit dr kareha and tell her what's really going on turns out the story he told chopper about the successful robber was about him however now he's dying again and he only has a few days to live. He chased Chopper off because he didn't want to die in front of him, traumatizing the poor child for life. At this point, he begs Kareha to help extend his life for just a little bit so that he can complete his research on the cherry blossoms and as his last act, show Chopper how beautiful the cherry blossoms really are. Kareha tells him what he's doing is nonsense and not medicine and they live on a winter island so you can never get cherry blossoms to grow here but she can extend his life by three weeks and for that hero look is grateful chopper was eavesdropping on this convo the whole time so chopper hearing the real reason why hero look kicked him out determines that he's gonna save him he's gonna save his dad he remembers at one of their ventures into town they overheard a group of soldiers talking about a mushroom that can kill any illness so chopper goes and raids hero look's library for books on mushrooms and he ventures out to get that mushroom he makes his way through the forest and up the snowy mountains alone and eventually he runs into some reindeer and they beat the absolute shit out of him. Chopper tries to fight back, but he's like getting his ass beat. However, he does see the mushroom he's looking for. He manages to get the mushroom and he returns to hear look broken and bleeding and offers him the mushroom that he painstakingly got. He then pleads with him to live so that he can teach him how to be a doctor like him. Hair look breaks down and he embraces Chopper saying that of course he'll teach him. He's got, he's even got the most important part of being a doctor, a big heart. Yeah, this is probably my favorite hero like line is where he says, of course you can Chopper. How can someone so kind be not able to become a doctor? We're almost to my favorite doctor hero line. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so Chopper has this mushroom that he painstakingly got and he uses the mushroom to make a soup and he has Dr. Hiraluk drink it. Hiraluk thanks him, claiming that he feels better already, even though the soup was absolutely disgusting. They notice that the beakers that they've been using to concoct the cherry blossom medicine that Hiraluk's been working on is bubbling in a way they haven't seen before. It's a success. The doctor finally did it. He made the cure. He hurriedly takes the powder that was created and runs out the door telling Chopper to sit put because he's injured. Chopper does as he's told, happy that he cured his first patient. Hiraluk bursts back in just to tell Chopper that he's gonna make a fine doctor and that he's living proof of that before finally shutting the door and leaving off in a hurry. He runs all the way to Kareha's place and he offers her the powder telling her that he doesn't have much time and he wants her to spread the cherry blossoms in his place. He also begs her to teach Chopper how to be a doctor. She says hell no, 
But as he rushes out the door, he knows that she's a good person and will look after Chopper anyway. Hair look, after leaving Correa's place, runs into town. He's heard a rumor that the country's 20 doctors that Wapple keeps under his control are sick and that no one could cure them. So as a doctor, he's taken it upon himself to go and heal them to save the country. He runs right into Wapple's castle intent on doing his doctor thing, but it turns out it was a ruse. Wapple spread false info about the doctor just being sick to capture and get rid of him. Meanwhile, Kareha bursts into Hiralik's home trying to find him, but only finds Chopper. She asks where he is, and he replies that he ran off after being cured by him while holding up the mushroom he used to do it. Kareha starts beating the shit out of Chopper, like just smacking him around, calling him stupid and an idiot. Chopper doesn't really know why, but it turns out the mushroom he gave him was a poisonous mushroom. Kareha tells him this, and Chopper doesn't believe her. He shows her the book where he found it and points to the skull and crossbones. From Chopper's perspective, the skull and crossbones are a good thing because as Hiralik told him when he showed him the Jolly Roger flag, skull and crossbones are a symbol of faith. But Kareha reveals to him, no, skull and crossbones aren't good. They mean poison. And Chopper breaks down crying at this and he rushes off to try to find Hiralik. Meanwhile, Hiralik is staring down the base of several rifles. Wapple has got his military men pointing rifles at Hiralik, and he's just gloating about how stupid he is to fall into his trap. Hiralik just collapses on the ground and says, you know, thank god no one's sick. I'm just happy that no one was actually sick this whole time. Wapple orders them to shoot, and at this moment, the most famous line from Dr. Hiralik is delivered. Hiralik takes out a sake cup, and he delivers these lines. You can't kill me. When does a man die? Is it when he's shot in the heart with a pistol? No. When he's struck with a deadly disease? No. When he eats soup made from a deadly mushroom? No. It's when he's forgotten. I may disappear, but my dream will live on. He goes on to say, well, first off, there is a reason that the the fight choreographer is doing the hero look flashback. Yes, yes. Listen, listen, thug. Hero look. I feel that nigga, man. If I can get real for a minute here, y'all. I know this is a goofy ass podcast. We, we talk about One Piece, a goofy-ass anime. But sometimes anime say some real shit. And this is one of those real shit moments. For me especially. Because I grew up, I'm growing up, I have a chronic illness. And so I thought about death a lot. About what happens if my chronic illness kills me. And I remember reading or watching this scene from One Piece. And hearing Hiralik say this. And that changed my whole perspective on death and on life. Hiralik basically passed down his will to his his little son Chopper. And because of that, it doesn't matter if he dies. Because he'll never be forgotten. And I just felt that on a personal level. Like, I know that even if I'm dead and gone, I made an impact on my friends and my family. So that... I will never be forgotten, you know? This is, hands down, we're getting a little early into the reflection stuff, but it's, it's a probably good time. This is like the best arc of One Piece so far that we have, we have read. And I think part of that is just that like, it's about doctors and like, as Hero like mentions over and over again, being a doctor is kind of inherently a selfless act because your entire life is in service to others. And that's why he wants to be a doctor, even though he's so bad at it. And this is just a man who, who does bad things and hurts people with him doing bad medicine. But he also hurts people actively by, like, stealing from them and burning, like, he, like, burned a guy's house down at one point, right? Mm-hmm. But he's still so filled with kindness and love for the human species. Mm-hmm. And I respect that so deeply that there's this character here who looks at all this unjust stuff that's happening in this kingdom and he even says like don't blame the people don't blame the administration don't even blame the king it's not really about him it's about his the society that he lives in and how it's made him you know it's made him evil 
but like it's not really his fault and we should still treat him with kindness because like that's the good thing to do yep and this is coming from a thief who burned someone's house down not very long ago is the cognitive dissonance that i really respect out of one piece like this is the only series i think you can really do that in and it like hits hard it, it always hits home so good hero look is that dude great he is that dude he was a good dad to chopper and he was real he always kept it real he always tried to help even though he didn't really end up helping a lot of the times but his heart was in the right place as Kura points out there are plenty of times when people would have been healed faster if he just left them alone and and also like when he mentions the deadly mushroom he knows that chopper fed him the deadly mushroom he knows, and he gladly ate it and said, bro, you're going to be the best doctor ever before he left the house, right? And I'm living proof of that. Yeah, because Chopper went out of his way and severely hurt himself for the sake of his father, even though he didn't quite understand that, like, this was not going to help, he had the right spirit. Mm -hmm. Just like him. Just like him, but also, like Kurha points out, you cannot cure someone with kindness alone. You do need expertise and an experience he goes on to say that someone will come to continue his work and that a monster will appear and that he's my son don't hurt him i love that line that might actually be my favorite hero look line where he says my son is coming soon so don't lay a hand on him that sends chills through my spine i don't know what it is about that line it just got me every time I read it. And at this point, he raises his sake cup in a toast and he yells to the heavens, What a wonderful life it was. Boom. He explodes. Hairlook blew himself up. Wapple just laughs at this. Right? He's like, oh, what a fucking idiot, bro. This guy just... He just killed himself. This pisses off Dalton, who sees Hairlook to be like an honorable man who wanted to help the country. Like, he tried his best to help the country. He heard that the t country's 20 doctors were sick, and he rushed over to try to cure them when no one else would. Chopper, at this point, rushes in and sees Hero look dead, and he starts to go berserk, but Dalton stops him. He turns into his, like, half-ox form, and he tackles him onto the ground and he tells chopper to run and live without you there's like no hope for this country so just run and live don't waste what hero gave you basically and with tears in his eyes chopper does this and he runs to find kareha and he bursts into kareha's place bawling and he begs her to teach him how to become a doctor so that's chopper's backstory now we have to go back to reality Eventually, Wapple and his henchmen, Chess and Kuro Marimo, they, they arrived at the castle. They start fighting the crew. Kuro Marimo, his powers like afros or these fuzzy like hairballs that he throws. And he starts just tossing them at Sanji. And the fuzzy hairballs don't come off. It's very much like Manetta from My Hero Academia. At this point, Wapple has eaten a cannon, and we learned that this is a trait of the Munch Munch fruit, is that whenever you eat an item, Wapple basically could turn into whatever he eats. He's basically like Kirby. So after he ate this cannon and he stored it, he turns his arm into a cannon, and he starts shooting at Dr. Hero looks flag, which Kareha calls like a memorial. She importantly, she had replaced Waffle's flag with Dr. Hero looks flag. Chopper can't respond to this at this time, so Luffy, Luffy sees this, and he starts to take action. He, he's pissed that you would deface a Jolly Roger, especially one that he sees Chopper has feelings for. So he starts standing in front of the cannonballs so the flag doesn't get hit. He protects the flag with his body. Wapple decides, you know what, we're going to switch it up. And he eats Chess and Kuramimo. He devours actual human beings. And the thing he turns into it can only be described as a f abomination. He turns into a house and out walks chess and kuromo but they've like fused together he calls this chess marimo and sanji tries to fight this chess marimo but kuroha 
basically fucking cripples him and tells him, hey, bro, you haven't recovered, so you need to sit your ass down. So Sanji's out. So that leaves Chopper to fight. And Chopper, he hasn't been in much, many fights before, so he was kind of like shell-shocked. He finally gets his guts together and starts to fight with Chess, Chess Marimo. What's more important is that he uses an invention that he made called a rumble ball. This is Chopper's own creation. It's a little ball that he eats. It basically allows him to change different parts of his body into his half form at will. He has several versions of this like guard point where he just puffs up. He basically gains a lot of fat and fur and he uses that to block attacks. He has arm point where like his arms get real buffed up. Through a combination of all of these different points where he's like manipulating his transformation at will, he uses it to find Chess Marimo's weaknesses and put a stop to him. However, Wapple is still here. Like he's still, he's still up and fighting. And he decides to go into the castle and eat some more weaponry to like get his stocks up. And along the way he runs into Nami and he realizes that Nami is like Luffy's friend and he continues to chase after Nami. Luffy however finds Nami in time to stop Waffle from like beating her ass but Waffle still escapes. Luffy pursues Waffle. But Wapple reaches a tower which supposedly holds a very powerful cannon called the Royal Drum Crown 7 Shot by Blinking Cannon. Wapple tries to shoot Luffy with it. However, while this cannon has been here for a long time, like it's been there since Wapple ruled the kingdom, some birds had made nest in it. And as a result, the attack fails on Luffy. Wapple then tries to use the cannon that he ate earlier to fire at Luffy, but Luffy just dodges it and sends Wapple into the ceiling. At this point, Wapple realizes that he's outmatched by Luffy, and he starts begging Luffy to spare his life. He even offers him like a position as second king, but Luffy does not give a fuck because he tried to hurt Chopper's flag essentially or here looks flag and he sends Wapple flying to another island with his gum gum bazooka. He also at this point Wapple mentions when he's begging to Luffy that attacking him is a international crime because Drum Island is a member state of the world government and Luffy is essentially attacking a member of the world government and Luffy says I don't care this is my fight and nothing can stop me from doing that. So again we're setting up this theme of Luffy not really caring about the politics of the world around him and just doing what he thinks is right no matter the consequences of what make him down the line. And so after Luffy sends Wapple flying into the air, very reminiscent of Alveda and Buggy way back in the day, um, Dalton arrives with Zoro, Usopp, Vivi, and some townspeople. Because if we remember all the way back before the flashbacks, Dalton was caught in the avalanche and he was presumed to have died, but it turns out he was just pretty frozen and the medical doctors who Wapo left behind treated him although the villagers didn't really want them to do that because they were pretty wary of them but they explained that while yes they followed Wapo's orders they were still inspired by hero luck six years ago on his dying words and so they want to help people now so once Dalton and the rest of the people reach the top of the mountain ready to like kick Wapo's ass they arrive just a little too late. Luffy announces to Zoro and Usopp that Chopper is to be their new crew member. And Kuraha just asks them to bring in their injured into the, the castle and she will work on them. Which includes Nami and Sanji who are hiding. Although Kuraha very quickly figures out where they are hiding and forces them back into a room. Where she like, she like belts Sanji down to a thing to keep his back straight so that way he doesn't hurt himself. Uh, very medieval. She is, again, no bedside manner. And Nami, trying to get out of this treatment, because she wants to get to Alabasta quickly, like we established earlier, tries to convince Kuraha to let them go early, and also to waive their payment, 
by giving her the key to the armory that she had stolen from Wapple. First she's kind of upset and mad that someone would try to swindle her like this, but then she kind of just agrees and uncharacteristically allows them to leave despite the fact that they are not healed yet. Outside, Luffy is trying to hunt down Chopper so they can leave with their new doctor, but Chopper refuses, telling them that it's impossible because he's a reindeer and a monster and they're humans, and they just simply can't coexist. However, Luffy, being Luffy, tells them to shut up and just come with them already, to which Chopper finally agrees after so much back and forth. Inside, Chopper tries to tell Kuroha that he's leaving, but Kuroha, in kind of a reverse Zeph moment, tries to guilt him into staying, even telling him that she's never heard of a reindeer on an adventure. And Chopper replies, yes, I'm a reindeer, but I'm also a man. Kuraha chases after him, but Chopper grabs the sled and takes his new crewmates down the mountain. When Dolan asks her if she's fine with the goodbye like that, she tries to act brave by saying that she won't have to feed a pet that she didn't want anymore, but she starts crying while saying that she's not one for sad goodbyes. As Chopper rides away from the castle, Kuraha begins loading something into the cannons that she had unlocked from the armory, and as the blast goes off, Chopper looks back and sees the snowflakes dyed pink to resemble cherry blossoms just like Kirillok wanted all those years ago. And he has created the panacea to save his kingdom. After the crew has left Drum Island, some guards bring Luffy's wanted poster to Dalton and they mention that a mysterious lone traveler showed up to the island about a week ago with that poster and interestingly, it didn't snow on that day. They say that the man was looking for Blackbeard, again the crew that knocked out Wapple months ago, but when he learned that Blackbeard had already left, he instead told him that if a pirate with a straw hat showed up to let him know that Ace will be waiting for him for 10 days in Alabasta, which they forgot to do, and so Luffy has no clue that Ace is looking for him. I wonder who this Ace guy is. He sounds cool. Curiously, after looking at Luffy's poster, Kuraha tells Dalton that Gold Roger's name is in fact Gold D. Roger, and she says that it seems the will of D is still alive, which kicks off one of the greatest mysteries in all of One Piece. I would argue this is definitely top three, maybe second most important mystery in One Piece behind What's what is the One, One Piece, Piece itself. Yeah. It also means that we can finally stop saying Gold Roger and start saying his actual name, which is Gold D. Roger. We have been holding this back for like two months at this point, because I didn't want to spoil it, but it's Gold D. Roger, just like his name is Monkey D. Luffy, so it seems that the D here seems to be very important. So back on the ship, Straw Hats celebrate another victory as well as the addition of a new crewmate, although Luffy and Sanji apparently don't know that Chopper is a doctor and only wanted him because A, he has seven different transformations that look really cool, and B, emergency food supply. Chopper thinks that he's forgotten his medical supply bag, but Nami produces it and tells him that it was already in the sled, making Chopper realize that Kuraha never actually planned on stopping him from going, and that she was always wanting him to leave with them. Between this and his new crewmate's enthusiasm, Chopper declares this is the happiest that he has ever been. Meanwhile, back on Little Garden, Mr. Two Bon Clay has arrived, only to find that Mr. Three has somehow escaped and now he can't fulfill his mission of killing him and Miss Golden Week. And as this arc ends, we see a shot of Sir Crocodile and Miss All Sunday in Alabasta as Crocodile leaves to eliminate some pirates. So this arc, like we mentioned earlier, we already did a lot of the reflection earlier, but this arc is hands down the single best arc that we have read so far. It, it gets better from here. I don't want to say like this is the peak of One Piece or anything like that, but this is so good. There's a lot of world building here. We learn a little bit about Dragon, we learn about the Will of D, we learn about Gold D Roger, we learn about Zoan Fruits. Like there's a lot of stuff peppered, we learn about Ace and Blackbeard. Yep. There's a lot of things here that are peppered in here that we will continue to build on up to the modern day. Like I said, yep. the Will of D is one of the greatest mysteries in all of One Piece to this day. And we're still working this out. This also has some of the best themes of One Piece. Like we mentioned earlier, there was a lot of anti-private medical you know, rhetoric in here about like a criticism of private healthcare systems like in America. And we didn't even get to this, but like Dalton, he says some interesting things, at least in the translation I was reading, is I was reading the colored manga and it's, it seems to be pretty different than like the Viz manga for some reason. And the 
the phrasing is like way more directed and political like there's a scene where Waffle is fighting Luffy and he says that Article 1 of the Constitution of Drum Island is those who defy the king's will are to be executed. This is the foundation of this country because I am the state and the state is I. Which to me, with a background in sociology, sounds a lot like the phrase you heard from anarchists where they say that the state has a monopoly on violence. I was like, whoa, this is really, really direct. And then also like on the way up to the castle, Dalton says like, what is a king even good for? What are our country's laws good for? What's so wrong about wanting to uphold kindness and sympathy in a country? Like Oda was on some shit that day, man. Yeah, this and this is like so early on. I've had some conversations with some people about like how political One Piece is and some of the things, and uh, you know, I've always been like, ah, I mean, it's political, but like, it's not really that. But I don't know. I'm, I might have been just straight up wrong that like. This stuff is like so explicit in a way that I forgot about. Doctor, even Doctor Curia extorted people. I think she's interesting because I think she represents this sort of like tacit understanding that you have to be able to be paid to do your job, right? Like your labor needs to be compensated because otherwise, you can't be like Sherlock and just give like free medical care because then you could turn to doing other things to other people, like stealing from them. She's to an extreme, but even she doesn't seem to really uphold that a lot like it like when she's like i'll take half your assets to the tavern she just leaves after that she doesn't really take anything right so like i think she's more just like scaring them because it's fun i don't really think that she's very interested in actually draining them dry plus she doesn't do anything with the money you know what i mean she uses it to stay young that's the secret to her youth is money so nami will be god nami will live to be like 280 but yeah great arc beautiful moments um really pushed me to like tears out of two favorite lines from one piece hero looks speech here was one of them. this is like mm, this might be like top five arc for me mm. it's it, it might be on the, i'll say the lower end of that top five like there are some other ones later on that i think are like exceptional but uh, this if, if arlong park is the point in which people like get into one piece this is the arc I think will define whether or not you like One Piece. Because like, if you if you leave this arc and just go kind of, eh, that was okay, I don't think One Piece is really for you. Yeah. But if you leave this arc and you're excited, then One Piece is absolutely for you. Because this is about peak One Piece. It's Oda that is best taking established storylines and putting his spin on it. It's basically Rudolph the Reindeer plot. For, for Chopper, but he put his own spin on it and made it into something that will make you cry at the end. Yeah. yeah. All right, so this brings us to our question of the day. So this comes from our friend Jesse, who asks, if Roger's crew knows where the One Piece is, why don't people capture them and make them reveal what it is and its location? Because they stupid strong and they be hiding. Yeah, so those are the, the two big answers is that like one, they're just kind of hiding. And then also like it, it's not so obvious at this point because the Grand Line so far has not really been a challenge to Luffy. But the power as we go along ramps up significantly. And to think about the kind of crew that would have to get to the end of the world especially for the, the very first time like Roger's crew did, you would have to be exceptionally strong. And so the people that are well known enough to go seek them out like Roger's first mate are incredibly powerful. And also most of them are just kind of like chilling out. I think the third thing is just really that most of them are just aren't very well known. Mm -hmm. um, they're just kind of dudes um, and that they don't brag about it because like the type of type of person who would join Roger's crew and make it to the make it to the One Piece is not the kind of person who like values it yeah. as as a thing in and of itself. They value that journey to get there. And so I think it's really it's a combination of they're in hiding, they're too strong, and people just don't know who they are. Yeah, like the one dude we've already met, Crocus, he was throwing spears the size of like four by fours. Like they were nothing. Oh. He's like swimming in stomach acid. Yeah, so. And that's the doctor, right? That's not even a fighting class on the ship. That's just the doctor, so. It's also mad narrative. It's not kind of the story One Piece is. Like, One Piece is a story about adventures. And even if you do this, even if you hunt them down and they kind of tell you, like, what it is or, and, like, where it's at, that still doesn't really help you because there's still so much you have to do to get there, especially strength wise. 
Like, you have to have an exceptionally powerful crew to be able to get there. So it's like, the people who are at that level are probably just like... I'm just go get it. Not interested. And yeah, yeah, exactly. They're just going to go after it instead of like hunting down somebody. So thanks for the question, Jesse. Um, if you have any more, please let us know. Um, and we'll try to answer them. If you if you have a question, please please leave us a comment. You can find us at Some Peace Pod on any social media that we are on. You can find me at Sunny Girl L Y K. And I am at Emperor Zone. And now you know what Zone means. So eventually, we'll know what Emperor means. Yeah. But until then, we'll catch you guys later. See ya.